Hey y'all, I'm Afton Jeek here, and welcome back to a video you may have seen before. I figured what better way to start my new year back from my break than to look to the past and revise a piece I'm not the happiest with. Even if you've seen the original, I'm not Disney, so this remake is actually going to be a positive change from what you expected in almost every manner, I hope. Thus, you should probably be fine to watch this one, even if you've seen the original. Alright, opening over, let's actually talk about the art of the hook. Again. Whenever I work on a piece of writing, be it a short story or even one of these scripts, I often find myself struggling to create an introduction that I feel satisfied with. So much of the reception of a piece is based on first impressions, and an early stumble could spell doom for an otherwise excellent work. After all, it doesn't matter if you've created the next great masterpiece if no one can bear to get through the start. I think it was because of this difficulty I felt in my own writing that I first wanted to create this video, not just to give my unqualified opinions on how best to open a story and get an audience invested, but also as a way to teach myself more on the topic. The hook has been set, so let's reel in the line. Hold on a minute before we continue on with this video, I want to take a second to remind you that subscribing to the channel is totally free, easily reversible, and shows me that you want to see more content like this. I know it's not the best introduction on my part to do this, but I'm a small creator, so I've got to remind you when I get the chance. Everyone done with that? Perfect. A young woman who turned out not to be as wise as she first appeared once told me that you should make the most of a first impression because it's the only one you've got, and this piece of advice is going to be the foundation for everything we touch on today. I wish that I could sit here today and tell you that there's a formula to create the perfect introduction, that you can just press a button or say the right words and you'll have your audience hooked but anyone even remotely familiar with the art of writing will tell you that this is at best a pipe dream and at worst a malicious attempt to homogenize storytelling. That's not to say though that there aren't techniques that you can use to improve your introductions. Specifically, I want to call your attention to the use of action, characterization, setting, and theme within the opening of notable stories in order to try and distill down that essence of engagement and bottle it up so that we might use it in our own writing. First of all, I want to get some definitions out of the way. You may have noticed so far that I've used introduction, opening, and hook interchangeably, but that's not quite correct. An introduction is, as the name suggests, when we are introduced to the world within which our story operates. The introduction serves the audience first, and the audience's expectations of and responses to the rest of the story are directly linked to how well that introduction works. I feel that a lot of video essays like to focus on writing fantasy a bit too much, myself included, so I want to use this opportunity to remind you that, in a way, every piece of writing has a world, even something as clean and sterile as a scientific journal. There are different degrees to which that world needs to be introduced to an audience, but that introduction always has to be present there in some form or another. An opening, meanwhile, has nothing to do with the audience. This is simply a term for the start of a piece, and something you'll notice is that these three concepts don't actually have to happen at the same time. Many stories will start with some different event before shifting their focus to the main stage of the plot. Perhaps it's a battle scene, or the establishing of a character who will be important later, or even some form of frame narrative around the main events. Regardless, this is the opening of the story, but it's not when we're introduced to the character's setting or plot. It's an aside, built to draw our attention. Speaking of which, that takes us to the last of these three, which is, at least according to the title of this video, the most important to what we're discussing today. A hook is a type of narrative device that appears early in a story to catch the audience's attention and ensure that they keep reading or watching or, in your case, listening. This can be as simple as the word choice within the opening sentence, or as complex as the relationship between two characters, but we'll get there in due time. For now, 
All you need to understand about a narrative hook is that it's essentially your literary first impression, and the thing that makes people want to keep going. There are a lot of types of hooks which develop in language, and in my original draft of this script, I had a whole section here talking about them, but I realized after I read through it that it was terribly boring. So here's a chart that I agree with in this manner. No, I couldn't find it with any more pixels. Feel free to pause if you want to give these a deeper look. As for the rest of us, we'll be continuing on with storytelling hooks. First up, let's talk about action. Action is arguably one of the easiest and most effective ways to get an audience engaged in a story, and it's not hard to see why. There's something in those primitive parts of our brain that gets us really excited when we see the bright flashing lights, quick motion, and explosions that accompany such a sequence. Which is why there's an entire genre of fiction that essentially just cranks that up to 11. Unfortunately for any aspiring writer who wants to use this primal kick in their introduction, there are a few negatives to consider. First of all, it's always good to keep your medium in mind when deciding whether this is the right direction for you. In visual media, like film or comics, these scenes work fine, as a lot of the content's grabbing nature comes from visual spectacle, which is kind of hard to do in a book, though not impossible. Even then, a good description of an action scene can be just as thrilling as seeing it play out on the silver screen, so novels don't really have to worry much in that regard. In the future, I might do one of these about how to write combat without being able to show it, but that's a lot more than this video needs to entail. Really, the one genre I wouldn't recommend trying this in is in radio or audio-only storytelling. Sorry podcasters, but this one probably isn't for you, unless you want to have to do a lot of explaining. The other reason that using intense action for your cold open may have negative consequences is that it's a really overdone method that can make your story lose a sense of individuality early on. From Indiana Jones to Star Wars, films in particular seem fond of using this method, probably because of that medium dependency I mentioned earlier, so I'd be careful about jumping straight to action. One film that I definitely think does an opening action sequence well, though, is The Dark Knight, sequel to Batman Begins and inarguably one of the best superhero films ever created. The reason that the action in this movie works so well is a little complex, but it mostly boils down to the fact that it isn't solely an action scene. While, yes, that can be said of a lot of these cold opens, this one in particular effectively sets up the setting, antagonist, main conflict, and even themes of the story with what could possibly have been released as its own short film. The whole thing is actually on YouTube, and I'm not sure if I'm legally allowed to tell you to go watch it, but just know it's there if you want to find it. In short, though, the scene shows a group of robbers breaking into what we will later find out is a mob-run bank. The exact terms of their employment are mysterious at best, and as things begin to descend into chaos with the bandits bumping each other off one at a time, it's revealed that their mysterious employer, the Joker, has been within their midst the entire time, left as the only one standing to drive away with all the money in a yellow school bus. Now this is essentially a heist film, compressed into five minutes, and the reveal at the end is not only a clever way to introduce the audience to the main antagonist, but also puts the entire previous scene into a new perspective, which feels very on brand. Plus, he's got a literal mask of sadness to hide a plastered grin of pure glee, showing that he's not a character to be trifled with given what he's willing to do for his own entertainment, and don't get me wrong, this is later proven to all be an entertaining power play for him. It's mysterious and chaotic, giving you the feeling that maybe, just maybe, there's more going on under the hood than we're privy to. In other words, I think it works quite well. The Joker is an engaging and fun character, don't get me wrong, but he doesn't quite fit into the next type of hook, which is a character-based hook. While the start of The Dark Knight does absolutely serve to illustrate the Joker's character, 
He's not given enough time or enough emotionality for his presence alone to make an engaging hook. Rather, a character-driven introduction is usually also an emotionally driven one, using the audience's investment in a particular figure within the story to ensure that they keep engaging with it. Because this style requires skillful writing of characters who the audience emotionally connects with instantly, it can be really difficult to pull off effectively. But I find that, when it does work, it tends to leave a lasting impression. Exhibit A, one of the most famously emotional openings in film, is up. Oh yeah, I'm going there. The film actually opens on a young Carl watching the escapades of Charles Muntz, but when I mention the moment that the hook of Up is set, you all know that I'm talking about the married life sequence. This beautiful and tragic roller coaster of emotions serves up a full platter of moments from our protagonist, Carl's life with Ellie, his wife. It establishes motivations for Carl throughout the rest of the film, while also showing a happy Carl full of life, which is juxtaposed to the Carl we see beating a man with his walking cane once we get back to the present. It's heartbreaking, and there's a reason that everyone still talks about it. The whole scene is a character analysis of our protagonist in its purest form, and when Carl is threatened with losing the house and thus his last connection to his late wife, it's just as impactful to the audience as it is to him, since they were right there for all of the strongest memories. Ellie's memory is a weight that Carl carries throughout the rest of the film, and without the married life sequence, it wouldn't be nearly as impactful as it is in the final product. Most of the things that a story focuses on are also the things that an effective hook focuses on, but sometimes an author will intentionally shift the focus away from the characters and their interactions to instead look at the setting and atmosphere of the story. These are hard, to say the least. They work really well when you have a narrator of some form, and this is probably my preferred way to start a story when creating a purely written work but it can sort of fall flat in a more visual medium. Often when it does appear in any visual media, it will be in the form of a short flyover shot, or some establishing shots to get a sense of the area, but the camera won't linger too long there. It's because films tend to struggle with this so much that I want to focus on one for this section. Stanley Kubrick's 1981 film The Shining is an iconic piece of cinema, and while I'd argue that it's still inferior to King's original novel, it's an awesome piece of film. A lot of that awe comes down to the atmosphere present in the story, never really letting up on the suspense, and that starts as soon as the movie opens. All of this tension and danger begins with a scene of a car driving along a winding mountain road. There's nothing inherently frightening about it, it's not a scary car, but the combination of the music and the camera angles lends the scene an uncomfortable feeling that's actually sort of hard to describe. The music is a huge part of that atmosphere, as you can see from the multitude of videos on this very platform, which completely changed the tone of that opening drive just by changing the background music. It's such a simple scene, but it works so well that I honestly recommend you just go watch it. Do it. It's worth your time, and when you're done, be sure to come back and tell me what it makes you feel. Everyone good? Perfect. I am a firm believer that themes are what carry storytelling, being the basis upon which everything else rests. You can have excellent characters or intricate world building, but they're all pointless if your story isn't saying something. That meaning can just be to entertain but it can also be a lot more complicated. Writing an introduction based on themes, though, is a monster of a task, and for reasons you might not expect. Since I've hit basically every other video essay cliche in the content I've drawn from so far, let's pull in the bard himself for this last one. Old Bill Shakespeare wrote a lot of introductions for a lot of plays, but none are perhaps as iconic as the introduction to teenage love story turned tragedy Romeo and Juliet. There's not a lot of ambiguity left by the time that opening paragraph is finished, since we already know that our two main star-crossed lovers end up taking their own lives, and that their feuding houses will reconcile over the tragedy, 
We aren't invested in trying to figure out what will happen to the main characters, because it's all preordained. Instead, this story asks us to think about what horrible events will take them there, and who along the way might wind up as collateral damage. In 106 words, almost every major plot thread, theme, and character are laid out for the audience, and much like the doomed lovers we follow, there's no choice in the matter for the viewers either. Honestly, I think that's a pretty powerful idea, don't you? Well, there we have it. The end of our short time together today. I've really enjoyed taking this opportunity to look backwards as we prepare for the future, and I'm excited to see what's in store. Maybe I'll do more of these. Maybe I won't. Only time will tell. Regardless, thank you so much for watching and engaging with the video. I've been Afton G. Keir, and good night, YouTube people.